Well, I'm sorry that Andrew Palooka is not here tonight so he can see uh, with what brevity that I can actually speak. Actually, uh, I try to control that time by actually writing out my, what I, my prepared remarks. And I figure about six pages about, about the right amount of time. The problem is I keep thinking of things to add to it, so how do I keep it? It's six pages. I found out that you can reduce the size of the font and still make six pages. <clears throat> so, the Wars of the Roses. They were a series of uh, civil wars fought over control of the English throne uh, in the mid to late 15th century. It was fought between supporters of the two rival cadet branches, and cadet branches just means uh, the male line descendants of the royal house of Plantagenet, Lancaster, and York. It was called the Wars of the Roses because there's more than one battle because of the heraldic uh, badges associated with the two rival branches of the royal house of Plantagenet. Uh, fighting for control of the English throne. That's the White Rose of York and the Red Rose of Lancaster. The wars extinguished the male lines of the two dynasties, leading to the Tudor family inheriting the Lancastrian claim. Following the war, the houses of Tudor and York were united, creating a new royal dynasty, thereby resolving the rival claims. The Battle of Bosworth, or sometimes called the Battle of Bosworth Field, was the last significant battle of the Wars of the Roses, fought on August 22, 1485. The battle was won by an alliance of Lancastrians and uh, uh, Yorkish uh, people, disaffected ones. Their leader of this uh, opposing army was Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond. Now he was later crowned as King Henry the Seventh, and you may recall his second son, King Henry the Eighth. He became the first English monarch of the Tudor dynasty by virtue of his victory and subsequent marriage to a Yorkish princess. His opponent, Richard the Third, the last king of the House of York, was killed during the battle the last English monarch to die in combat. Historians considered Bosworth Field the end of the Plantagenet uh, dynasty, making it one of the defining moments of English history. Now there's a story, uh, perhaps apocryphal, about how Richard III was defeated by Henry Tudor in the Battle of Bosworth Field. And the story goes like this. A blacksmith was shoeing uh, with some urgency uh, Henry uh, Richard III's horse in prelude to the Battle of Bosworth Field. From a bar of iron, he made four horseshoes. These he hammered and shaped and fitted uh, to the uh, horse's hooves. Then he began to nail them on, but after he nail had nailed on two shoes, he found that he had only six nails remaining. That's not enough for the other two shoes. Since the battle was about to begin, he did not have the time to forge additional nails. He couldn't run down to Home Depot. So he affixed the remaining two shoes with the six nails, three to a shoe, and that's too few to, or for a uh, secure fitting. During a heated moment in the battle, one of the horse's shoes flew off. The horse was lamed on a rock, then another shoe came off. The horse stumbled and Richard was thrown heavily to the ground. Now, if you look at the historical account, it, uh, if it's true, of course, uh, Richard's horse was got stuck in mud and he fell off. But <clears throat> this is much more interesting, so we'll go with this one. Before the king could rise, his uh, frightened horse, although lamed, galloped off. The king saw that his soldiers were beaten and that the battle was everywhere going against him. He waved his sword in the air and he shouted, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for, for a horse. 
Now this uh, phrase, regardless of its veracity, was immortalized in Shakespeare's Richard III, Act V, Scene 4. But there was no horse for Richard. His soldiers were intent on saving themselves. They could not give him any help. The battle was lost. King Richard was killed. Now, an interesting note is that his remains, of course, lost over time, but they were located in 2012 and reinterred uh, somewhere else, uh, McDonald's parking lot or somewhere. I don't know where it was. Henry became king of England as Henry the Seventh. Now, this story gives rise to the following proverb. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the battle was lost. For the failure of battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Now, a critical element of this proverb is uh, missing. A horseshoe nail does not itself alone secure the shoe to the hoof. Someone must perform this task. In this case, it's the blacksmith. Now, it is true with most great and noble endeavors. There must be someone to make or apply something seemingly insignificant and inconsequential as the nail so that the kingdom may be saved. There are but a few times in history that uh, Abraham Lincoln or Winston Churchill comes along. And it's usually in times of great national crisis and uh, they inspire the citizenry to pursue some worthy cause or to resist some great evil. Despite the millions that these men have inspired, their inspiration would have come to naught in the absence of the many small efforts by innumerable concerns and busy hands. There must be blacksmiths to apply the nail. So it is with the Lord's work. Nothing is inconsequential when efforts, however small, are carried out in harmony with God's will. We should never minimize the nobility of the small things when rendered in service to the Lord. As an example, Nehemiah was permitted by King Artaxerxes to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. It is recorded in Nehemiah, the second chapter, verses 11 through 16, that Nehemiah viewed the condition of the city but told no one of his plans. It reads in part, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what, what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. So I went up in night by the valley and viewed the wall. And down verse 16, And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or others who did the work. But then in Nehemiah, the second chapter, verses 17 and 18, he did tell them what his plans were. It reads, then I, but then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jeru Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be an approach, be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let's rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. In Nehemiah 4, chapter verse 6, we read, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now, the individual tasks to be done were many and small, but each was vitally important to the, to the accomplishment of the wall building. There were no complaints about the smallness of the task, for the workers knew that each little task was an advancement to the goal of rebuilding the wall. In the book of Ezra, we read that the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem began under Zerubbabel. However, because of opposition and perhaps the enormity of the task, after the foundation was laid, construction ceased for a period of about uh, 16 years, Ezra 424 and did not resume until the reign of Darius. 
In Haggai, the first chapter, verses 1 and 2, we read, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, this is what the people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. But as recorded in Haggai, the first uh, chapter, verses 3, 4, and 8, the Lord said, And the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it, it, is, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses in this temple that lie in ruins? Verse 8, Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple. Also in Ezra, the fifth chapter, verses 1 and 2, Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God, the God of Israel, who was over them. So, so Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and it's the same person, even though the spelling's a little different, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with him, helping them. The word recorded in Zechariah, the fourth chapter, verses 6 and 7, that came to Zerubbabel through the prophet Zechariah proclaimed that he was to finish building the temple by the power of God. It reads there, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone and the shouts of grace, grace to it. When there's a work commissioned by God and performed in a manner approved by God, however small or noble the task, though it be as a mountain difficult to encompass, it will become as a plain easy to transverse. Looking again to the book of Ezra, it is said that when the temple foundation was laid, many were saddened by the comparison of the new temple to the glory of Solomon's temple. In verse 10 it reads, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, uh, down later it says, the people shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and heads of the fathers and houses, old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. They remembered the glory of the uh, temple of Solomon and they thought this was too small. Too, too small for some, but it was enough for the Lord. This is an important uh, principle for us to remember as recorded in Zechariah the fourth chapter, verses 8 through the first part of 10, which continues the temple building proclamation. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall finish it, also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? Even though one person can only do so much and whose efforts may be small in our eyes, we are reminded that it is not so when the small things or in the service of our Lord. It would not be by human force, strength, wealth, or prestige, but by the will of heaven that the work will be accomplished, however insignificant or inconsequential of such individual efforts may seem to us. Even a great mountain would become as a plain when one works as the Lord directs. When the work is Jehovah's work, predetermined by the Lord and carried out by his directives, it is noble and consequential. No work, however small, such as the new temple, is insignificant or inconsequential. Everything has a place. We should not despise the day of small things. As Paul said, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8:28. Of course we should not ignore 
the weightier matters. Jesus himself said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weighty matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Do the small and the noble also. That's Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 23. No opposition, however great, that stands in the way of God's people who are charged with a specific duty can stop their advance so long as it is God's will for them to move forward. It has been demonstrated throughout the Bible, and it's true today. Consider what happened in the case of Gideon and the 300. Of course, you know, we could give other examples, but uh, this will suffice. In Judges, the seventh chapter, we read that Gideon was to attack the Midianites. He had 32,000 with which, uh, which the Lord deemed to be too many. Now, we're reminded of what Paul wrote in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, vessels that the excellence of the power of God may, uh, excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Just as in the case of Zerubbabel and now Gideon, it is the excellence of the power of God that these things are accomplished. So the number of Gideon's army was pared down even further by seemingly, uh, by a seemingly insignificant act. When brought down to the water, those who kept vigilant while drinking were chosen. They were ready for any potential ambush. There were only 300. And the 300 surrounded the Midianite camp. At the word of Gideon, they broke the pitchers in their left hands and blew the trumpets in their right hands and shouted, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Is so shocked and panicked the Midianites that they fled the field and were soundly defeated. Interesting in this deal, there's no miracles ever performed. Such little things as 300 torches and trumpets worked against great odds because Gideon and the 300 trusted in the Lord and were willing to be guided by his will. So it is with us today. We must not, in trying to think about how we can make a big difference, ignore the small daily differences we can and do make, which over time add up to big differences that we often cannot foresee. There is therefore virtue and virtue in smallness and steadfastness in a noble cause when God is on our side. Even a committed flea biting strategically can make even the biggest dog scratch. Yes, it will take work. As they say, even mosquito does not get a pat on the back until it gets to work. As the poet Edward Everett Hale said, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. Therefore, take pride in small things you do for the Lord, even though such tasks uh, go largely unnoticed. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.10? Our faithful Father in heaven will notice. Nothing escapes his attention, and we will be rewarded accordingly. Do not let the kingdom be lost for want of a nail. So I'll leave these words with you. If there's anyone that needs to respond to the gospel call to, to uh, put on Christ in baptism or to be restored to a, a state of faithfulness, we want to allow that opportunity now as we stand and sing.